Today's Macintosh and Macintosh adjacent shenanigans are brought to you by Squarespace. But more on that in a bit. Hello, I see that you've noticed my giant disorganized pile of Macs that has exploded all over my desk. No, we're not about to build the jankiest, most disorganized vintage Mac network ever seen, because I actually just got back from doing that at VCF East, where I set up an exhibit running a MUD on a Quadra 950 with my friends Steve from Mac84 and Mike from Mike's Mac Shack. It was quite a fun time, and many, many Macintosh shenanigans were had by all. So today, let me walk you through our exhibit, tell you a little bit about why MUDs are so special to me, and we'll take a look at some of the other cool goings on at this year's Vintage Computer Festival East. So stay tuned. And if you think that spending two days wandering around a glorious sea of beige is a weekend well spent, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. I got a lot of inspiration from the show and there's some really cool projects in the pipeline, so it's definitely worth sticking around. There are a few things that I would get up at 6.30 in the morning for. I guess vintage computers are one of them. VCF East 2021 was held last weekend, October 8th through the 10th at the InfoAge Science Center in Wall, New Jersey. And I am pretty freaking exhausted. But man, it was a ton of fun. If you're not familiar, the Vintage Computer Festival is an exhibition put on by the Vintage Computer Federation in several installments all across the US, along with some international versions. I'll put a link to the VCF site in the description below because there might just be an event near you. I had an exhibit with my friend Steve from Mac84 and Mike from Mike's Mac Shack, and there were a lot of machines that you've seen on all of our channels. One of the show's themes this year was text adventures, which is pretty awesome for me because that was a lot of my childhood. So we had all of the Macs networked to my Quadra 950 running AUX, which was running a circle mud that I modified. That's a text-based multiplayer game that was a huge part of my computing youth. So in today's video, I thought I'd show you a few of my favorite exhibits from the show, walk you through our exhibit, talk a little bit about why muds were so important to my computing coming of age, and then show you a Mac that I picked up at the show, which I'm super excited about. So load-in was on Friday, October 8th, which was a whirlwind of beige and networking cables all around the campus, so I didn't actually get any video of that. But that's okay, because I have this weird habit of arriving to things way too early. On both days of the actual exhibition, I was there before 7.30 in the morning, and I got to wander around all the exhibits before anyone else showed up. That was neat. And man, there was some incredible stuff. It's hard to pick favorites, but here's a few. There was a full Next Cube battle station, along with a Next Station and Next Station Color, and all of them were for sale, and I'm really, really kicking myself for missing out on the Next Station Color, which is one of my Grail machines. That cube setup sold for $1,000, which is actually a great price for that fully functional setup. Now, the exhibit right next to ours was a bunch of weather stations which used to power the Weather Channel. I had no idea how much tech went into these things, including one of them being an SGI Octane officially built by SGI into a rack mount case for the Weather Channel. The software for these was lost after the satellites powering them were shut down. So this team reverse engineered the operating systems from the boards themselves and got them all running, including replica graphics and fonts pulled from their ROMs and they were playing good old Weather Channel smooth jazz for the whole show, which was quite nice. I think my favorite single machine was this ginormous 70s IBM System 34 5340, with a terminal sitting on top. I've always been fascinated with these things, and getting the chance to actually use the machine and run software on it was incredible. Although, I tried to run Lunar Lander and then couldn't figure out how to exit it. <laughs> How do we get out of this lander program now? Who knows? <laughs> 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 
Luckily, somebody else with more knowledge came along and got some fun stuff going. <laughs> there. All right. Amazing. There was also this cool Mac XL, which was running soft Windows and Windows 2.0. That was certainly neat, but pretty slow. Now, there were a ton of other cool exhibits. Literally all of them were cool. I'm going to link to a video from Mike's Mac Shack with an excellent walkthrough of the event. But now, I'm really excited to show you what we built for our exhibit. I'm also really excited to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. Easily create the web presence you've been dreaming of building even with no experience using Squarespace's all-in-one platform. It's really easy to get started. Like if I wanted to build a site for my circle mud, I'd just choose the type of site that fits me best and then choose from a whole host of really beautiful templates. Sites built with Squarespace are fast, responsive, mobile friendly, and built for SEO. So users can actually find their way to my Quadrant 950's mud connection info from any device. Plus, there's a whole host of tools included to help you run your online presence. Email marketing, SEO, analytics, e-commerce, and more. So check out squarespace.com slash action retro today for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use code action retro to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And now back to the show. So MUDs are pretty interesting in the history of the internet and online gaming. Way back in 1975, a single player adventure game called Dungeon was written for the PDP-10. Back then, pretty much any interactive game running on a computer was revolutionary. This game was a single player fantasy text adventure, implemented as a dungeon crawl and implementing some of the rules of Dungeons and Dragons to allow the player to hack and slash their way through a monster infested dungeon. A few years later, Roy Trubshaw and Richard Bartle over at the University of Essex thought that Dungeon could be even more fun if it was multiplayer. And thus, they wrote a multiplayer version of Dungeon on the PDP-10 and cleverly named it Multi-User Dungeon, or MUD. Fast forward a few more years, and by the late 80s and early 90s, MUD servers have become immensely popular. People have written all manner of new servers inspired by the original MUD, and most were freely available to download, modify, and run yourself. One of the most popular was CircleMUD, released in 1993, originally as a bug-fixed improved version of the open-source DikuMUD. It was a fun hack and slash focused game with lots of great multiplayer features, which was also really easy to download and modify and run yourself on whatever hardware you happen to have. When I was in middle school, my friend's older brother worked at a dial up ISP and unbeknownst to his employer, he hosted a circle mod called Asridia on a server there. I became absolutely obsessed with this game. My friends and I would wind up at the school library sitting at computers next to one another and spend ages telnetting into Asridia, much to the chagrin of the library staff. MUDs were my introduction to real programming. I had toyed around with QBasic, but CircleMUD is written in C. I remember setting up SigWin on our family's Windows 98 computer so that I could use Unix tools to compile and run CircleMUD from my house and then being amazed when I could tell that back home from the school library. Man, those were magical times. But let me give you a quick tour of our display, show you the running mud and the different computers connected to it, and uh, sorry for the audio on this because it was quite noisy at the show. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, two tables together and we have a pretty nice setup of mostly Macintosh stuff. And uh, some IBM, who knows, uh, you know, whatever that is. Yeah, I know I tried to make an Apple versus IBM joke there, but in all seriousness, Mike's IBM PS2 model P70 with that beautiful, glorious orange gas plasma display is seriously cool, and I'm very glad that he brought it. <laughs> and uh, we have the MUD running on the Quadra 950 which has actually been pretty reliable 
Only crashed a couple times, tried to figure out why, couldn't figure out why, gave up, and uh, it's fine. <laughs> and we have several computers connected to the MUD, including Mike's G5, which has the MUD up right now. This is Mike's prototype G5. Here we go. This is why that Mac is a prototype. So the G5 never shipped with a CF card and SD card reader. But there it is, magically, in this wonderful prototype. And look, EyeSight, so technically, this machine is slightly better than the fastest iMac G5 that was ever released. This cube is running Minecraft now, but it can run the mud. And then we have, sorry for the flicker, LC575 and the new clear Cursed Mac, both connected and then via you have Ethernet. The one of the really cool things that happened was meeting N Commander, who has an excellent YouTube channel that you've probably heard of, and if not, I'll link to it in the description down below because there's some really excellent geeky stuff. He decided to try and dump the firmware from Mike's prototype iMac, and uh, well, I'll let him explain it. So this is N Commander. Um, I run my own channel. The production iMac G5s have the hardware to add that, but they don't have the correct firmware for it. So me and a friend spent some time, and we were able to at least figure out how to dump the firmware. The problem is it dumps so slowly it didn't finish. Yeah. yeah. So, but I was coming by to get the contact info so we can do this properly, and hopefully everyone with an iMac G5 can now enjoy a built-in CF card slot. Yeah, because the iMac G5s have the solder pads for it. And just if we get the firmware dumped off of this one, potentially we can put that firmware on stock ones and populate that stuff, which is pretty incredible. Yeah, again, end commander from YouTube. Thank you, sir, for your hard hacking work. <laughs> it was so awesome sharing the booth with both Mike and Steve. We really had a blast. And plus, there was always someone to man the fort if someone wanted to go wander around. Now onto the Mac that I found at the show, which I'm super excited about. And actually it's been hiding right here the whole time. And I know you might be thinking, wait, don't you already have a PowerBook 540C? And I do, and yes, this one's hinges are, uh, they gave up the ghost a while ago. But this machine has a PowerPC upgrade in it. And it also has fully intact front panel plastics on the screen here, where mine, I had to 3D print those little brackets to hold it in place. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the power book that I picked up at the show from the pretty excellent consignment area that I kept checking for cool new stuff. And a lot of very cool stuff did pass through, but this thing is supposed to be PowerPC upgraded, and it actually came with a bunch of other parts for PowerBook 540Cs, including a brand new LCD screen. And uh, this screen doesn't look like it's broken, so we don't actually have a machine to put that into. So it's kind of nice to just have that spare sitting around. And also something interesting that I noticed, this is my PowerBook 540C that we restored on this channel and put the 3D printed brackets and stuff in. And I noticed that the track pads are different between these two machines. This one is much darker and much slippier and actually feels a lot better to touch than this one, which is actually a little rougher and has more resistance. So I kind of prefer the one on this PowerBook that I picked up. And also the keyboard seems to be a bit different. This one looks a lot nicer. It's uniform in color still to the plastic case. And it also has a texture very slight to the top of the keys, whereas this one, the keys feel much more smooth and it's, I suppose, yellowed. I'm sure it wasn't originally this color. Uh, but anyway, when I got this one, I took it back to the hotel. It came with a power supply, so I plugged it in and nothing, no boot. So I've taken the known working power supply from this machine right here and I've plugged this machine in and uh, I also have to reconnect the display because the hinges are completely destroyed. There we go. Definitely have to be careful with that ribbon cable because it's right up against the broken metal hinge. So 
That's why I have it propped up against the LC575 here. But yeah, let's uh let's see if this thing boots. Hey! It chimed. Nothing on the screen yet. Hey, Happy Mac, we're booting. It's a bit dim, but I don't know if that's just the brightness setting. Otherwise, the screen looks pretty good. Maybe a little bit of fading around the edges here. I think probably this one has a better screen in it. Yeah, check it out. This thing works with a working mechanical hard drive. And, uh, what are we running here? Whoa, look at that background. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, about this computer. We are running System 761 with, uh, well, what I believe is maxed out memory. Apple System Profiler. Yeah, this thing is pretty close to maxed out. That's the maximum RAM, 36 megs, and an 88 megahertz PowerPC 603E. I think the fastest made for it was a 100 megahertz from Sonnet. And in a future video, we'll definitely open this up and take a look at what exactly the upgrade card is that's in here. And it comes with a hard drive. Ooh, and there's stuff on it. including a whole bunch of games. Awesome. Look at that. We've got Lemmings, Dark Forces, a whole folder of Marathon. Out of This World is on here. Wow, lots of stuff. Oh, we even have emulators. Awesome. Game Boy and uh, INES. I'm not going to get too far into what's on this hard drive on camera, of course, but it seems like there's a lot of cool games on here, at least, which uh, I'll definitely have to rescue. Okay, so that's incredibly exciting that this machine works, has max RAM, and has an 88 megahertz PowerPC 603 upgrade, which is a great revision of the PowerPC processor. So I think my plan is going to be Combine these two machines into the best possible PowerPC PowerBook 540C. And I'll probably use the plastics from this machine and the back panel for the LCD from this one, this keyboard, this mouse pad, this screen, and uh, yeah, probably clone this hard drive at least for the games and then reinstall maybe even macOS 8.6 just for fun. So that'll do it for this recap of Vintage Computer Festival East 2021 and my kind of love letter to the art of the mud. I really hope you enjoyed it and uh, I do have a question for you. I think it would be pretty impractical to leave my Quadra 950 running all the time as a mud server. So I copied the entire thing over to this Raspberry Pi, which uh, coincidentally runs the game about 20 to 30 times faster than the Quadra. Uh, that's pretty funny. But if I put this thing online, would any of you be interested in playing the mud with me? I would love to use a mud, sort of like I use Minecraft, to test computers and how they can connect to the internet and how fast and practical it is. So Minecraft, I can test on machines like this G4 Cube, but the MUD will give me something multiplayer to test on machines like this PowerBook 540 with the PowerPC upgrade. So let me know in the comments below if you'd like to try playing this MUD because I have all the infrastructure online to make it available and uh, it's really not that bad to just leave a Raspberry Pi running all the time. So if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and if you'd like to see more Macintosh shenanigans like this, please subscribe down below. Thanks for watching. Thank you.
And a special thanks to Chris, Al Greta, Tom, Stig124, Justin D. Morgan, Greg Rutke, Chris Calderon, and Nick Hamsey, who are my highest tiered patrons, and all of my Patreon supporters who help to make these videos possible.